I guess uh, because this is a workshop about theory and practice, I should start with um, the way that theoreticians like to view constraint satisfaction problems. So they will tell you that you have some variables. Every variable has a finite domain. They will tell you that you have some constraints, each of which has a scope. So the scope of a constraint is the variables over which it's defined. And then there's a set of feasible tuples uh, over this scope. And then they'll start telling you that uh, old constraints form a network. And the idea here is to give every variable a value from its domain, such that each constraint is satisfied. Just like in SAT, there is a bit of a divide between the way that theoreticians and practitioners think about constraint programming. Practitioners will tell you the following. Okay, we have finite variables, we have these integer variables, we have array variables, set variables, graph variables, partition variables. And then a the constraint is something like xi plus yj equals z. So here, x is an array potentially of integer variables. i is a variable. y is an array of integer variables. Uh, j, again, uh, an integer variable. And z also a variable. So uh, potentially variables all over the place. We might say that, for example, all different. So variables a, b, c, and d all have to take different values. And we might say something like knapsack. So uh, knapsack, which is, which is already NP-complete, NP we might express this as a constraint. So we might have some weights and some profits. So um, these are potentially arrays of variables. Uh, how many items we can pick? These sum up to give us, again, variables of uh, total weight and total profit. And then we have something that we want to solve, like uh, lexicographical optimization or we might want a diverse set of solutions, or we might want to find a parity front. And in particular, we are quite often talking about optimization problems where um, we, we really don't want unsat as an answer. So um, we are optimizing something or we really want a solution rather than that we're trying to prove that something doesn't exist. And uh, modern constraint programming people will also tell you about search. So they will say, oh, it's a good idea to branch on these variables. So I thought I'd put up a, a bit of a dictionary for people who are not used to constraint programming talks. So when I say a problem, what you should, what you should think of is a high level description of what you're trying to do with parameters. When I say model, I mean a description of how we encode a problem. When I say instance, I mean we are going to take a model and apply it to a set of parameters and we're going to get something out that we can solve. So you can think of this as being like your CNF. When I say a solution, I mean a model. Uh, when I say propagation, I, I mean propagation, but it's more complicated. When I say variable heuristic, I mean something a bit like VSIDs. When I say value heuristic, I mean polarity. And when I say no good, I mean a learned clause, but it's backwards, so it's the negation of a learned clause. Uh, so it's, it's something that is no good, okay. Uh, and then once we've done this, uh, SAT and CP are basically the same thing, except for the terminology. Maybe a bit more. We talk a lot about modeling in CP. We have many modeling languages. Uh, there's Essence, MiniZinc, XCSP. Uh, probably many of us, uh, there is a fairly large gap between what the user specifies and what the solver gets in many situations. So the going from a high level model to the low level model that solvers actually solve is, is quite often the big deal. People also use specific solvers directly as libraries. So it's quite common to embed a constraint solver inside a, a larger application. Here's an example. This is a MiniZinc problem. So I'll not go over this in detail, but everything up to here is just part of the input. So we're saying, we're going to be given some flour, or we're going to be given some banana, which is an integer, we're going to be given sugar. We're going to make some cakes. Uh, these we're saying here, var. So these are things we're actually finding. And these are constraints. This is, this is actually an integer linear program. Um, we have our objective, and the most important feature of any modeling language is a way of outputting the solution so that the user can read it. Um, this feature is vital, and it does kind of affect how you can compile the problem. 
Alternatively, since we have some people from St. Andrews in the room, this is an example of modeling in the essence modeling language. Again, I'll not go into details, but we're starting to say here, find me a sequence, which can be any size up to horizon of total functions from this set to this set. Um, so we're really encoding structured variables in a high level modeling language here. Um, search that in a bunch of constraints. This is, this is in fact a, a planning type problem. XCSP, I, I don't think any of the XCSP people in the room, so I can say that I really don't like this, but there is an XML modeling language that somehow embeds things that are not XML, so you still have to write a parser in this. I, I don't know, but it's popular in France. You can use a solver directly. This is how you would use the G code solver. So somehow you are defining a class that has these variables that represent your problem. You're defining these constraints and uh, you can really program anything you want to about the solver. So branching heuristics, propagation, etc. cetera. Uh, apparently people like Python now. Uh, we have a Python modeling language that is suddenly extremely popular. So this is Sudoku. This is probably the nicest way of writing out Sudoku that I've seen. Oh. In particular, in constraint programming, we care a lot about finding a good model for a problem, or even finding multiple good models and then solving them all simultaneously with what we call channeling constraints between them. And in contrast to SAT, where you are given the CNF and you must obey the CNF, you must not question the CNF. Uh, in CP, we will change the model as much as we like. Um, we consider it completely fair game to solve the problem in a different way to the way that we're being given. Uh, some of this is automated, some of this relies upon human modelers. The question that always comes up is, is when is CP actually good? Uh, in particular in comparison to SAT. My rough answer to this is, okay, what if we are mixing several different kinds of constraints? So for example, difference constraints, logical constraints, integer linear inequalities. If we're mixing these constraints and they interact in, in interesting ways, then somehow um, the CP solving techniques based upon consistency seem to be quite good at tackling this. Another area is um, sometimes SAT encodings are just too big. I work a lot on subgraph solvers. The encoding size for subgraph isomorphism in SAT uh, will kill you uh, much faster than it will in CP. Uh, so there's an advantage to not having to write out all the constraints in CNF. When you want a human understandable model, I think this is, I think this is potentially a big deal going forwards. Um, if we're a bit careful, we can write minis incorrescence so that a human can understand what we're solving. I would argue that very few people can read the DIMAX CNF format and understand really what the, what's going on there. Another area is where you have optimization problems, but you have hard constraints. Um, so you have some constraints that you absolutely cannot violate. Um, again, in this case, I would argue that constraint programming is potentially much better than trying, for example, um, classical local search. Uh, which So I mean, what we heard this morning, I mean, so why can't I express these CP problems uh, directly for an SMT solver? I mean, you have different kinds of constraints and- right? Yes, so I, I, I will get onto this, but I think CP solvers and SMT solvers are converging. So um, traditionally CP didn't do clause learning and SMT had very weak theory solvers. Uh, now, modern CP solvers do clause learning, and SMT is getting stronger and stronger. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're getting very close to each other now, I think. Uh, if we want to do this translation, we should think of like a constraint is like somehow a theory or, or a, like what's the translation back and forth? Yes, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to go on and define constraints in a slightly interesting way. So this will probably answer your question. So how do solvers work? We have behind the scenes something, some way of storing variables. Um, 
quite often we can have multiple representations. So for small variables, we might use bit sets, large domains, we might just do bounds. Some solvers optimize if you give lots of Boolean variables. Um, Circuit variables might have their own representation. Some solvers do have set variables internally. Other solvers compile everything down to integer variables. There is, as far as I can tell, no agreement on whether solvers for CP should be copying or trailing. Uh, my own solver does both, and there does not seem to be any difference between the two. Uh, copying and trailing? Uh, so copying versus trailing, when we branch, we can either copy the entire state of the solver, and then when we backtrack, we just forget it. Or trailing, we use these reversible data structures like in SAT. This, this was a big de debate in the community for about 10 years. Um, as far as I can tell, it's completely irrelevant on modern hardware. Um, so constraints. Here is, here is a somewhat interesting definition of a constraint. A constraint is really something that defines an inference algorithm or a propagator, okay? What do these inference algorithms do? So at minimum, they have to tell you whether or not they are satisfied. So if I have an all different constraint, it has to tell me, are these things actually all different or not? If I have an integer linear inequality, I, it has to tell me, are, are, is the inequality actually respected or not? Ideally, these constraints also give us information about inferring something. So if I have um, uh, x plus 100y is greater than or equal to 80, and x is 0, 1, then it's going to tell me that y has to be at least 1 here. Okay. Um, in newer solvers, uh, hopefully constraints can actually give you precise explanations for uh, why things aren't feasible. Uh, we will have a talk later today on using even more information where they can tell you which values in a constraint are most likely to occur. And the other thing here, and I, I, don't, know whether, I don't know whether SMT has adopted this yet, but in CP, our constraints are usually stateful algorithms. So we're going to be doing quite expensive computations, and we don't want to do these computations from scratch every time the constraint is, is called. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work into putting state into these algorithms that somehow remains valid on backtrack. We do occasionally represent constraints as a list of feasible tuples, possibly in clever ways. This does happen, but we try to avoid it. So, uh, we already heard about consistency this morning. I'm uh, just going to talk a little bit about it. Um, our basic notion is arc consistency, specifically where we have constraints between two variables. I'm going to say that a constraint is arc consistent if for each value in the first variable, there exists a value in the second variable that supports this assignment and vice versa. And then for general constraints, I'm going to define generalized arc consistency, just to mean that um, every value in every variable exists in at least one solution to this constraint. And we can also define other notions like bounds consistency, just looking at the highest and lowest values of the domain. <coughs> Finding consistency can be hard. Um, if we consider integer linear equalities even over zero one variables, this is effectively a subset sum problem. So just determining whether there is a solution to this constraint is, is already NP hard. Solvers potentially will still do this anyway uh, if you give it a constraint with small numbers involved. We can take this constraint, we can turn it into two integer linear inequalities. Uh, generalized arc consistency on two inequalities separately is easy. Um, we, can, we can just look at the bounds of the variables. Um, this does not give you the same, so Consistency on a decomposition does not give you the same as consistency on where you started off with. In particular, if we're dealing with integer variables, then we see this has no solutions. Um, so consistency should tell you this, but consistency on these inequalities doesn't really tell you anything. Um, so the, the representation matters. It really matters exactly how you specify a constraint. And the question is, do we actually care about consistency? Um, so I believe for historical reasons, 
Some people think that generalized art consistency is absolutely the right thing to do for every constraint propagator. Oh. There are a couple of reasons for this. Um, one is that all different was the first global constraint that was really dis uh, discovered in detail. And there is a very nice generalized art consistency propagator for all different. And then after this, people started saying, okay, so we should look for generalized art consistency propagators for every constraint. The other reason is if the only thing we can do is look at one constraint at a time and start deleting values and variables, generalized art consistency is the strongest possible thing you can do. Which again, this, this is potentially a nice property. Although these days, solver authors tend to care about what can we do fast rather than what can we do that gives us um, nice theoretical properties. So uh, I will solve knapsack at every, recurs at every recursive call in a solver potentially, if I think this is the best thing to do to help me solve the rest of the problem. Okay. Propagation. Uh, unlike in CNF, constraints can propagate more than once. So uh, constraint A can propagate and tell me something. Constraint B then propagates, and this gives me some new information which lets constraint A propagate again. So essentially what we can do is run every single constraint over and over again until we reach a fixed point. Uh, the obvious question here is, is this fixed point unique? The answer is, it depends. If every constraint is generalized about consistency, yes. If every constraint has a certain monotonicity property, yes. Some constraints, some constraint propagators in practice do not have these properties. Oh. And then, there is a huge amount of engineering effort in how do we propagate all these constraints as quickly as possible. Um, we can do generalizations of two watched literals, except potentially you have to watch an awful lot of things. Uh, we have events, we have multiple constraint queues. Um, sometimes you can determine a static ordering of a constraint that will work. Um, but this, this in general is a very difficult problem is to figure out how to run your constraints as quickly as possible. The thing here is constraint propagation is slow uh, compared to SAP solvers. Uh, we might be running very expensive propagators many times. And a, a full round of constraint propagation can potentially take seconds to complete. But also constraint propagation is very fast. Uh, for some problems of a right representation, we can infer thousands or millions of facts per clock cycle. Um, so even if you somehow had a SAT encoding that gave you the same level of consistency as a CP solver, for some of these constraints, the CP solver gets there so much faster. Um, potentially, we have these better constant factors from propagators. Uh, and the other thing is not having to deal with a large encoding is sometimes a really big deal in practice. Um, so this goes both ways. Constraint propagation is both very slow and very fast. Okay, we also do search in constraint programming. We do backtracking search. We propagate it every, every node in the search tree. We quite often specify variable and value order in heuristics. So uh, a bit like vSIDs and polarity, uh, quite often the modeler will specify these. We, we know some good rules on um, how to specify search. We will also quite often restrict the solver to only branching on certain variables, which we call the decision variables. Um, again, this is um, this is some, something that a good model can do, that they'll have an intuition that you should only branch on these variables and everything else should just be calculated. It's a surprising to me that the model there uh, gives you like which variables to branch on typically what happens from my experience is the modeler will say okay well here's a cryptographic problem you should branch on the keys which is almost surely the worst thing you can do because mm -hmm. uh, yes right so and that's the direct and immediate intuition of every modeler who works in yep. cryptography and then you have to teach them so i'm like usually i don't trust any of this i just like ignore like the best thing you can do is ignore actually reverse is usually the best thing you can do but <laughs> what is your experience with this uh a good modeler knows this um the the thing is a, a lot of cp very a lot of cp encodings will look like okay i am producing a timetable I'm going to have my timetabling variables that tells me, okay, 
what am I going to schedule at which time in the timetable? And then I'm going to have these hundreds of auxiliary variables that are used for calculating, you know, staffing costs, et cetera. Um, if, we, if we think of a simple workforce scheduling problem, it is actually a good idea to decide, okay, I want this person to work on this day. And it's a really bad idea to decide that um, seven people are going to work on this day. Uh, but somehow you, you, have this, you have this variable because you want to start talking about the capacity of um, you know, uh, capacity constraints on how many people work. So there are certainly variables where if you branch on these variables, it will completely kill you. There are variables where branching on them, on them is moderately sensible. Um, but what tends to happen is you need to find a good branching variable somehow. You let the modeler give you a hint and then the solver will start doing something a bit VCD. It will say, okay, which variables tend to appear in conflict? And it will know to branch on those. Uh, but, uh, the default is usually automatic. So the user doesn't actually have to specify anything most of the time, and the solver will determine the variable and value. There, there are defaults in most solvers. Um, they're okay. That's <laughs> Yes, so um, so we do a backtracking search, and uh, th this is the point of VSIX. We we start saying, okay, either which variables appear in lots of conflicts, or which constraints appear in lots of conflicts, and we can start um, biasing. So we can say this constraint is ten times heavier than this constraint, and so on. If if a modeler is good, we have program program search. We can do things like uh, branching on expressions. So um, there's a, a car assembly line example. You don't decide I am going to produce this car on this day. Uh, you decide I am going to produce a, a red car on this day. Uh, and somehow this is, this is a really big deal. And I think theory people can potentially tell us something about this. This is a bit like branching on extension variables. Uh, possibly, uh, you, you might disagree with this one. Uh, well, I mean, extended resolution, right? Yes. You mentioned this variable that represents this constraint, and your this constraint is your is, is a form of bound uh, extended resolution. No. It's it's a, it, yes. Um, this this is effectively branching on an extension variable of this reifying a constraint. Um, well, you could argue that you could just put these variables in the original model and solve right. the problem that way. So yeah. We do do restarts. We do do restarts. They seem to be much less frequent than in SAT for whatever reason. Um, they seem to be mostly about boosting weighted variable order and heuristics in practice, so telling us how to branch. Um, we can do no boots from restarts efficiently, so effectively. Um, we do some complete branching over a subtree. We have an efficient way of saying never visit that subtree again. But finally, this is this is getting to the connection with SMT. So, in a in a traditional propagator, we'd say, okay, we've made we've guessed some assignments G, and now we know that X is not equal to five. One way of thinking about this is we're going to generate a clause that says uh, if you do all of G, then X cannot be equal to five. Uh, we can think of this as being a new constraint, and we can add this into the solver. Um, but of course, you can be much more specific. You don't have to say that all of these guesses led to this conflict. You can say this: these three very specific things mean that x cannot be equal to 5. Um, so we call this lazy clause generation. One way of thinking about this is you can have a really, really strong CNF encoding, but you can create it dynamically when you need it. I thought I'd go over a bit about uh, how the all different constraint is actually implemented in solvers. Uh, John told us a little bit about this in, this morning, so uh, I will go quite quickly through this. Um, here is a simple constraint satisfaction problem. So I have three zero one variables, um, and I want them to be all different. So this is the same as uh, two coloring a triangle, or um, was it you're trying to put three holes in two pigeons, and then one of the pigeons has to have at least two holes in it. Um, so unsatisfiable. Uh, 
One thing we could do, we could decompose this into not equals to constraints. And then think about what propagation would do. So we have a constraint, x1 is not equal to x2. We think about arc consistency. So if x1 takes a value zero, then x2 takes a value one, that's fine. If x1 takes a value one, then x2 takes a value zero, so that's okay. If x2 is zero, x1 is one and so on. So uh, consistency on the decomposition tells us nothing at all. Uh, obviously a human will look at this and say, no, 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 this constraint is unsatisfiable. Um, so if we don't compose the constraint, what we're looking uh, what we're looking for is a propagator that will do the same thing, a propagator that will tell us straight away there is no solution to this problem. Uh, so as we saw earlier, we're going to create this um, bipartite graph. So variables on the left, values on the right, an edge if a variable can take a particular value. We can find a maximum cardinality matching in this in polynomial time, so here. And we see that x3 is uncovered. So in this case, the, the best possible way of giving variables values only gives two of the three variables a value. And you can see there is, in fact, a correspondence between uh, perfect matching, so matchings that cover everything on the left-hand side, and solutions to the constraint. So for example, if we had an additional value here, we would now be OK. And does, does anybody actually do Sudoku solving? Uh, OK, Karam, there's two people. I, I give this lecture to our undergraduates and then ask them why they don't just get the computer to do it for them. Uh, this, is, this is kind of a massive denial of service attack upon human intellect, I think. Uh, <laughs> OK, Karam, tell me, if these are the values left in the boxes, what are you going to infer when you solve this? I have no idea. Okay. C can anyone tell me anything you can infer? One on the left. So the one on the left, box one has to has to have a value one. Uh, okay. Anything else? <laughs> you can throw out the two and three at, the, at, 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 at out of that two, three, five, eight, the two nine. Two and three. Yep. At, so at, 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 well, you can. Try the two and three everywhere. Yeah, okay. Anything else? Nine. So nine has to be at the end. I think we're going to see something else first. Uh -huh. Five is going to be one of those next three. Yeah. So we, we have a, a four, five, six, a four, a four, five, a four, five, six, and a four, five, six. So we know they have to go somewhere. So that those can't go there. Uh, seven, nine, seven, eight, nine, eight, nine. Uh, and I think this is, this is everything we can do. Okay, so we need an algorithm that will tell us this. Um, let's, let's go back and think about consistency. So uh, I'm going to call a whole set, a set of n variables whose domains have exactly n values between them. And there is a theorem that if we, so if we find a whole set, so if I can show you n variables that have n values, then none of the other variables can take those values. There is a theorem that um, if we can delete every single whole set, this is equivalent to deleting every edge from a, max, from a matching graph, which cannot appear in, every, in any matching. So if we can delete every whole set, we delete every value that cannot appear in at least one way of satisfying a constraint. Um, so we achieve generalized arc consistency. I'm not going to prove this to you. One direction is easy, one direction is not easy. So can we find whole sets? Well, there are like two to the n potential whole sets, so we can't just check them all. And we also can't enumerate every perfect matching. This is, this is sharp p hard. But there is still an algorithm. Roughly speaking, and I'm just showing you this to show you what solvers do inside search. Um, we're going to create the, um, the value graph. So variables on the left, values on the right. We're going to put in edges if a variable can take a value. We are going to find some arbitrary matching. Any edge that's present in the matching, I'm going to turn into a directed edge from right to left. And any that isn't is going to be an edge from, um, 
left to right. I'm going to split this up into strongly connected components using the most beautiful algorithm in the world. Uh, and I am only going to look at edges that go between components. And something mysterious and magical happens here that if you, if you understand what alternating paths are and you think about this really hard for half an hour, you'll, you'll understand why this works. Uh, every edge that's left, every, every edge remaining that goes from left to right uh, corresponds precisely to deletions. And every edge remaining going from right to left corresponds to forced assignments. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to prove this. I just want you to know that during search, a constraint propagation algorithm is uh, finding lots and lots of maximum cardinality matchings and finding strongly connected components all the time. So does generalized art consistency matter? Uh, is it worth doing this? Here is a Sudoku problem from the Glasgow Herald newspaper. They say it's easy. I solved this using the Choco solver. It took me one recursive call and 13 milliseconds to solve this problem. This is using a decomposition. Using the all different constraint, it took me 17 milliseconds and it took me one recursive call. So all different is slower, uh, not worth doing. Okay, let's try a slightly harder Sudoku puzzle. We know it's harder because the newspaper tells us it's harder. Uh, okay, using the decomposition, 34 recursive calls, um, 24 milliseconds to solve it. Using it all different. Okay, two recursive calls. So we've cut down the amount of search. And I've gone from 24 milliseconds to 22 milliseconds. So uh, a clear strong advantage to all different propagation here. <laughs> OK, this is a superior Sudoku um, <clears throat> using the decomposition. Uh, it takes us 14 nodes and 20 milliseconds. Using all different, so two recursive calls and 22 milliseconds. Ah, uh, we're slower again. Uh, OK, this is the world's hardest Sudoku. Let's, let's get a benchmark instance that actually shows the difference. Using the decomposition. Um, 855 recursive calls to solve. It's kind of interesting that the human levels of difficulties do roughly correspond to solver recursive calls, sort of, a bit. Using all different, okay, 83 recursive calls. That's surprisingly high. Uh, we go from 57 milliseconds down to 49 milliseconds. Uh, so at this point, the conclusion is that nine by nine Sudoku is, is too easy for constraint solvers. So um, let's go bigger. This is a 36 by 36 Sudoku. Using the decomposition, uh, it timed out after an hour. Using all different, we can solve the whole thing in 200 milliseconds and 28 recursions. Um, so I mean, the, the conclusion here is somehow that the stronger propagators might win eventually on large, large and hard ben benchmark instances. Um, they're not necessarily a universal win. There is a very long paper on how to implement all different quickly. Um, in particular, uh, if you start doing things like incremental matchings rather than recomputing from scratch, you end up with a propagator that runs 168 times faster. Uh, we need this level of research for every single global constraint. Um, I will skip this because I don't think people are awake enough, but if you want to challenge when we can go back to this slide and you can tell me something that a constraint programming solver can't do. But the main point is propagation only considers one constraint at a time, uh, whereas humans can reason about multiple constraints simultaneously. We do have various ways of combining constraints, but somehow combining multiple constraints simultaneously is potentially also a hard problem. And one last thing is, um, this is interesting that uh, Nina, who is in the room, proved a long time ago. Uh, there is no polynomial sized CNF encoding such that unit propagation on the encoding of all different gives you generalized art consistency. So somehow a SAT solver cannot do this no matter how good the encoding is. Oh. So I think this is, this is potentially interesting. Okay, what else is exciting in constraint programming? Um, 
My personal project is proof logging. I think we need proof logging for constraint programming. Yes, I just curious uh, when you, if you were comparing with SAT solvers and the 3D encoding, because for quasi groups, this is a long time ago. I know that SAT C on the 3D encoding was better than CP approaches yes. using on the old diff constraints. So, which is the status right now? Uh, right now, we know a lot more about implementing all different and getting it to run quickly than we did when those experiments were carried out. Um, this factor of 168, I mean, this. This matters. Um, I, I know some people say, oh, all different doesn't matter based upon a slow, all different propagator on fairly small problem instances. Um, if you have a fast, all different propagator and large problem instances, sometimes it matters. Not, not always, but I don't think there's an easy answer. Uh, Proof logging for CP, yes, we need this. Uh, constraint programming solvers do have bugs. Um, this is hard. We can't just compile to SAT because the encodings might be wrong and uh, we might not have uh, strong enough reasoning in the SAT solver. We have all these propagators that do all these kinds of clever reasoning. And somehow we still need a proof format that's simple to verify. So what we cannot do is have a proof format that has uh, 400 different rules in it for each of the 400 global constraints. Uh, we will have a talk tomorrow. Amazing recent progress. Uh, suitability and proof logging is exactly what we need. So cutting planes is exactly the right proof system to justify every single propagation algorithm. Oh, thank you. Uh, Constraint-based local search. I put this in because it does not satisfy Karam's definition of local search. Uh, we can do this. I said at the start of the talk that we're really looking for solutions to problems. Uh, if your solver spits out on SAT, then the business people who want you to schedule their uh, factory will get very upset and say, yes, but why is it on SAT? And it turns out that solver says no is, is not an answer. Somehow, if you, if you have high-level constraints, you can somehow get a very small core that can give you human understandable explanations uh, some of the time. Belief propagation, we have a talk on this this afternoon. It's really cool, so I will skip it. Decision diagram solvers, we heard about these this morning. These are also really interesting, but I will skip this. Parallel search, we can sort of do this in constraint programming, probably slightly more successfully than in SAT. Um, we have various ways. Um, randomized work stealing is terrible. Confidence-based work stealing, so stealing based upon where you think solutions are likely to be, sometimes quite a lot better. Embarrassingly, parallel search is a bit like cube and conquer. It's very easy to implement. It works very well for some problems and is terrible for others. Uh, my own pet project is to abuse restarts and value ordering heuristics and just share no goods. Uh, this again works very well in some circumstances and not at all in others. We also have two competitions in the CP community. We have a mini zinc competition and an XCSP competition. Uh, they don't cover a lot of solver features. They're not really the primary driving force behind evaluating solvers uh, like they're in the SAC community. Uh, a lot of solvers don't compete or aren't eligible for the competition. I think this is, this is both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, okay, I was gonna finish with a very brief description of how constraint programming also gives us a way of implementing algorithms for other problems. And I was going to tell you about subgraph solving, which is my favorite activity. And in particular, how I took everything that constraint programming had taught us and used it to design a subgraph solver. Um, but uh, is the state of the art until uh, the HKI papers come out and then I'm going to be second best uh, until I win again. Um, <laughs> so this kind of problem, but uh, Karam inspired me that for, instead of talking about engineering, I'm going to talk about science. <laughs> uh, so maximum clique, I give you a graph, find me the biggest set of vertices that are all adjacent to each other. The way solvers work in practice, they are very stupid. They propagate very quickly using bit parallelism. They use graph coloring as a bound. They color the vertices. 
So adjacent vertices have to get different colors, so you can use this as a bound. And they iterate from right to left. So whichever vertex was the last one that got the highest color, you branch on this vertex first. Um, this is absolutely the established wisdom in the uh, clique solving community. And the reason is vertices in the rightmost color class are generally expected to have a high probability of belonging to a maximum clique. And then if you find a really good clique quickly, this helps you, you know, reduce the amount of branching you have to do. It gives you a strong bound in the algorithm. Uh, nice, easy, scientifically testable claim here. Um, it's completely untrue. I, I actually tested it. Uh, in particular, right to left ordering is still best, even if the algorithm is only proving optimality. And better clique algorithms have worse anytime behavior. So as, you imp as clique algorithms have improved, it takes them longer and longer to spit out a good solution. I am not going to go into much detail on this, but CP gives us a way of understanding branching heuristics. I am going to hypothesize that when you produce a coloring, the rightmost color class is going to be smaller than uh, any of the other color classes. This is a bit like smallest domain first. So what greedy coloring and branching is actually doing is emulating smallest domain first, which we sort of understand. And I can test this. So this is what would happen if color classes were not permuted. Um, so if if color classes were equally likely to be of equal size all over the place. This is what would happen if color classes are uh, completely sorted. So we always have the smallest color classes last. And this is what we see in practice. And we see more stuff is up here. So it means color classes are approximately sorted by size. We can look at what happens if we go, so number of recursive calls on random graphs, if we use the default ordering, if we sort of sort it, and if we sort things, so we can reduce the search base size by like 20, 25%, um, again, confirming the hypothesis. Has almost no impact on runtime because sorting is expensive. And it was very hard to publish this paper because the algorithms venues I sent it to said, um, who, who cares, you've not produced a faster algorithm. Uh, CP took this paper, so this is, uh, this is why I started being a constraint programmer. Uh, Aaron wants us to do science. I am going to argue that science on SAT solvers on industrial instances is like saying to the alchemists, please go and explain biochemistry. <laughs> that same for some really simple experiments. So let's take a simple clique solver. Let's take simple problem instances, so random graphs. Uh, the one thing I'm going to do is very accurate measurements in a huge sample size. So this is a million core hours of time, uh, about a billion problem instances. We can see some interesting things happen as we vary edge probability on how hard it is to solve problems on random graphs. This looks like a nice easy curve until you zoom in and you see here are these strange wiggly bits. If you understand phase transitions, you might think that this has something to do with it, and you would be right. Uh, we can look at how long it takes to find versus prove optimal solutions in these random graphs. We can start breaking things down by um, actual witnesses. So. Um, if, if the actual maximum clique size is small, then it's harder to solve. And if the actual maximum clique size is big, then it's easier to solve on average. Uh, we can start saying, oh, maybe this is because there are more witnesses. Uh, not that simple. Uh, and we can look at any time behavior using a good heuristic, where we're seeing that we start off finding small cliques and then we finish quickly, versus uh, using a bad heuristic, which actually finds good solutions faster. Um, I just wanted to put this up there as a sort of thing that you can do if you're dealing with much simpler solvers. Uh, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Some questions? So, Yaran, can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear a voice. It says Zoom. Yes. Ah. Um, you said that uh, restarts are less frequently necessary than in SAT solvers. Do you have a personal explanation for this? Uh, I, I can hypothesize that we're not really learning very much. Uh, if, if you look at what restarts actually help you with in a classical CP solver, they, they help you with your branching heuristics. 
But somehow, if we're not doing closed learning, it doesn't help us learn better things. So my hypothesis is, if you're not doing learning, then you're not getting very much out of the restarts. They are relatively expensive to do, but they do help you decide how to branch later on. Um, this, this is what I think is going on, although uh, I could not tell you how to design an experiment that would test specifically this claim. Uh, Okay, thank you. Uh, so do we have something similar to face saving when it comes to polarity selection? Uh, yes, so we call this uh, value ordering heuristics. Um, quite, often the, quite often there is really a correct thing to do. So either you want, either you want to give variables uh, low values or you want to give variables high values. Uh, and quite often the modeler will specify this. We don't have good automated ways of figuring this out. Like I can, there is a good default heuristic in solvers for variable ordering. Somehow value ordering is, is trickier. Um, yes, that's an uh, open problem, I believe. Yeah, it, it, uh, the click examples you show were based on random yes random grad did i mean did you try things like planted clicks or uh, which might um also i mean when people actually want to find the maximum click they might be doing sequence alignment or something like yes. that um, um so so, so, so you, yeah, you know, are there other uh, good sources of, of, of data because because yeah. I, I know from experience with SAT that that random problems are completely different from oh, yeah. industrial oh. problems. Yeah. Yes, I mean, the, the aim of the experiment is not to explain every single aspect of why click solvers work in practice. The, the only thing I'm trying to do is formulate the question which is simple enough that I can answer it convincingly. Um, so yes, in, in practice, uh, click solvers are used on all kinds of graphs um, and we have no idea why they work. Hi, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Medell's question about the, about the face saving or value selection. So in 2018, we did some study on this and we concluded this idea about like simulating local search seems very mm -hmm. effective. And that's the idea where you say the phase is similar to what Nadell was talking about. And we show that somehow it looks like some automated large neighborhood search. In our experiments on the Minizig benchmarks, it made a huge difference for many, many benchmarks. So I would say that's a very good way of automatically doing like the value selection here. It doesn't work for all problems, but for a lot of them, it does really, really well. Yeah, although it, it doesn't seem to have made it into the solvers as a default yet, which is so we have it yeah. in Chaps. I have implemented in Geese implements it. Okay. All our tools also implemented it, so it's in the solvers. Okay, good to know. Um, you said that the pseudo boolean proof logging seems like the right model for you. Yep. But the problems you're encoding don't necessarily have boolean very value zero one value yep. variables. But you think. You can encode enough of, you can use uh, zero one encodings of enough things to be interesting for you. So, uh, there will be a talk on this tomorrow. So, uh, okay. I'll, I'll leave that one to Venna. That sounds you. good. One more question. I don't really question this time, maybe just a cheeky observation about the value ordering <laughs> thing and said it's an open problem but of course having a good value ordering like at the extreme is finding the solution yes so i think there are limits on how well you can do in value orderings thank our speaker again Can I just have your attention for a minute? I'm not going to give a speech here. Uh, yesterday in my uh, arithmetic 